So I reckon spring is in the air. It is, yeah. Daffodils. Um, my neighbour was cutting his lawn the other day, which is cutting his lawn. Yeah, <laughs> I think he might regret that after the uh, the hard frost we had this morning. But uh... <laughs> yeah, I'm not quite at the cutting the lawn stage, but I'm, I've got spring flowers in the garden. And this morning, as we're recording this on a Friday morning, it's um, sunshine outside. It's amazing. It is a beautiful day. So let's um, we'll, we'll finish this rubbish and get out and go for get a out walk. there. <laughs> <laughs> just just one, uh, one thing before we, we, we crack on is uh, just to encourage people to, to listen to the very end of today's podcast because we've got a special offer which we're going to share with listeners at the end of the show. Welcome to another Hidden Wiltshire podcast. Um, my name is Glyn Coy and I explore Wiltshire with my camera and um, come onto this podcast every two weeks to talk about it. And with me, I have my trusted sidekick, Paul Timlett, who uh, also lugs a camera around Wiltshire taking photographs of wonderful things. Um, this week, I wanted to start with, before we get into the, the guts of um, part two of the Devils, um, a couple of people have written in to me over the last few weeks and um that'll before be both, i go into that'll be both listeners then yeah two out of the three maybe <laughs> um don't do yourself down i've seen the listening statistics and we've actually got quite a fan base now yeah not bad um international fan base as well yeah. so um a couple of people wrote in and um before i go in into what they actually wrote i'd just like to say we do welcome questions so if you've got any questions or comments about anything that we say that might be right or wrong or you've got an issue with or you want to encourage us or just talk about anything that we've um, covered in the podcast do reach out we're, we're open to um, people writing in and talking about what people are, are saying to us um, you can do that via the website hiddenwiltshire.com there is a contact page there where you can fill in your details um, or you can find us on the Hidden Wiltshire um, Facebook page and fire us a message there as well. So um, the first person um, who wrote in was um, Chris Ashdown and he wrote in a couple of podcasts ago. We talked about the area around Bratton and Eddington and, and we talked about the rapeseed fields by the um, Long Barrow. And I mentioned that I felt that there was a reduction in the amount of rapeseed in, in Wiltshire in general. And we ummed and ahed about whether that was right or wrong. But he's confirmed that it's actually correct um so on oil seed um rape um the, a lot of the treatments of this for the seed and for the crop um are no longer allowed to be used um there are rules and regulations that have come in that have um, prevented them treating the crop so they've become susceptible to flea beetle um and some crops have, have really been devastated from that there was a field near urchfont that was almost wiped out so it's become uneconomic and some farmers are pulling out of, of actually um, planting the rapeseed, which is why we don't see it as much in, in the Wiltshire landscape. Yeah, I, I read up on it um, after that, that podcast. And I think it, if I'm right in saying that it was in the, the Netherlands got really badly hit by um, yeah. the, the beetle or what it, whatever it was. Yeah, I think, I mean, I mean, it was me that was disagreeing with you about the, the rapeseed. So I was completely wrong. But um, I mean, certainly looking around here, I think because we've got uh, somebody who farms it pretty heavily yeah. and produces rapeseed oil, you know, I, you just see a lot of it here. But uh, Yeah, and, and to be fair, the discussion was because <clears throat> last year in that field um, on Eddington Hill, there was a lot of rapeseed. So I did see some, but it was, I think the comment was more about, when I would drive over towards um, Avebury from Devizes, those fields in the past have been, you, you can drive along and the fragrance of the, the yellow flowers comes through into your car. And But but last couple of years, I haven't seen the rapeseed up yeah. there. Yeah. But um, that was the reason why. Um, another person that wrote in, and this, I think you'll be happy with this and, and happy to reply to this particular question, but it was from um, Hannah Dorr. And Hannah um, is, um, she farms Bridge Farm with her husband um which is the area that covers tan hill and um ribery camp and around there so she did ask the question um well she said really enjoying your hidden wiltshire podcast here at bridge farm all cannings in the pusey vale we have the neolithic iron age ribery camp tan hill and wonsdyke just wondered if you had ever visited 
have you ever visited Paul? Ooh, and um, <laughs> once or twice. <laughs> And, and she's made the point that they have some spectacular walks and views from the hills. And we can confirm that. Yes. And we can also confirm that we have walked there and we are fully intending to have uh, more than one podcast on that part of the world. Yeah. And I, 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 I think I bumped into, uh, is it Hannah, did you say? Hannah Dorr. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, think I bumped into what must be one of her neighbours, um, uh, delightful farm, a guy called Jim Reed. Um, and I was walking up around that area and bumped into him um and he there's 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 a a, a place that a hang gliding club or whatever they call them so that's, that's not the right terminology but they go up there to to, to fly and there's a, a sort of gravel track that goes all the way up to the top of the hill and um jim charges something like one pound five p or one pound 15 p to, to go up there and um, he sprung on me one day when I was coming back down and said, I noticed you didn't put pound fifteen in my box. <laughs> <laughs> Pur- purely because I didn't have one pound fifteen. I think. Yeah. But a lovely chat with a really nice bloke. And yeah, um, yeah I even took his photograph, and which is which is on my website, but not for sale. <laughs> yeah. But it is nice up there. And I think we will go there. It's, it's interesting, actually, because I know Hannah Dorr um, and her husband, um, their uncle, Tim Dorr, who I know via Twitter, he built the long barrow at All Cannings. Which... Ah, yes, that was it. Yes, I knew I knew that. Yeah, so so we might in the future. I haven't asked him yet, but maybe we'll get him on to talk about that. And um, or maybe I know find, that the... you'll find a place for his long barrow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but the the other area up there, of course, is um, Milk Hill, and um, I know the farmer who farms that, David Carson. So um, I'm sure he listens. And David, we might get you on at some point. So um, I'll be in touch. Yeah, and of course, a lot of the land up there is owned by. Um... Uh, natural england who i'm a as I bored you rigid about I, i'm a volunteer so uh, it falls within our sort of area so every now and then sort of some of my colleagues go up there and do some work on fencing and stuff on on uh, milk hill and around there yeah yeah definitely so what have you been up to in wiltshire over the last couple of weeks? uh well yes yeah, so that was almost a, an intended segue there talking about natural england and <laughs> nature reserves um i've spent a fair bit of time on the reserve last uh, couple of weeks um i've been doing some helping out with some bird surveys up there which we do i think once a month um and uh, i'm not much of a birder I, I i love looking at them and i love photographing them but i don't really know i'm not that good at identifying them. so i've been going out with a guy who's much better than i am a guy called rich Pryor, who um i think he he listens to the podcast occasionally he takes beautiful bird photographs so i've been helping him sort of just identifying species and counting them um been doing some of that and um last couple of days we've been up at the reserve doing uh, we're putting up otter fencing now don't get excited there were no otters on parsonage down but it's a very effective form of fencing so we're, we're installing um uh, uh, a willow bed to um but I won't go into all the details, but to, 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 it's a better way of treating the silage runoff from the um, from the farmyard. Mm. Um, so we're, we're, we're putting in this this uh, willow bed, but it's got to be protected because as <laughs> the guy that we who, who runs the volunteer up there said, you know, it's a very leafy tree and it will be like a salad bar for every deer in South Wiltshire. So we've got to protect it. And otter fencing is the most uh, effective means, apparently. But um, I yeah, so I I also went out and did um, I I put something on the Facebook group about um, concerns about Old Ditch Barrow, which sits above um, Tillshead, which we um, my here we go another five pounds from Stew, my walking mate Stew uh, and I, we went up there um, uh, last week I think it was just to have a look because um, we'd been we'd, we'd met somebody a few weeks before who said that the old ditch barrow was being sort of destroyed by people riding motorbikes over it so we thought we'll go and see for ourselves and uh not not quite right the 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 barrow is 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 not being used for riding motorbikes it's it's actually covered in a sort of chain link fencing to um on just laid on the ground to protect it from burrowing animals but um it seems to have done a good job stopping motorcyclists as well. So th- there, there was no sign of, of any damage. I mean, they've been riding up and down the tracks um, next to it, but not on the barrow itself. So, so that was good. So I've updated um, the Till Valley uh, walk that I posted about on the, um, the website. Um, did a blog about that. Um, so updated that with some photographs of Old Ditch Barrow and uh, White Barrow. And... Um, 
yeah, the Tool Valley newspaper want to or newsletter want to run that article as well. So I've supplied some photographs to them um, to, to go in their newsletter. Fantastic. Um, That's really good, actually. Oh, yeah. It's good, actually, when we get that sort of collaboration from local um, publications and the rest of it um so yeah that's that's yeah. really good news and what you, you've been doing some stock checks again haven't you yeah i've been counting sheep counting sheep <laughs> I, not, I've got to cure, I've, not to cure my insomnia I've got to, yeah, it's the obvious question is it <laughs> i can see you sitting on a hillside nodding off I think, damn i'm gonna have to start again <laughs> it's actually more difficult than you think but yeah i mean what i do um one thing i do a couple of times a year well, not well. A couple of periods a year, I head up to Dunscombe Bottom, which is just outside Nook, um, which is a Wiltshire Wildlife Trust uh, reserve. And uh, as a sort of voluntary activity, I go up there to stack up, uh, check up on the livestock. Um, so in the summer, we usually have a herd of um, Dexter's cows, um, and in the winter, they put some sheep on. And at the moment, they put 31 sheep onto the reserve a couple of weeks ago. So I was up there um, at the weekend. I did a sort of walk around Nutcastle, which we talked about a couple of podcasts ago. Um, I went over to Dunscombe Bottom to to count these sheep. And it's, as I say, it's more difficult than you think because... Um, they keep moving, yeah, don't they? They do. You've got to, you've got to get <laughs> quite close. Um, because if you try and do it from a distance... Um, you, you just fail yeah. and and you, you you're supposed to count 31 and there's 25 and then there's 34 and it's just a nightmare so you do have to get quite close but um you the, must you must get to know them quite well to, to, to yeah they get to, we, to know that to know that you haven't counted one twice you know you, you yeah, tell them apart. We, we each year we get to know get to know each other quite well the herd and myself and it was quite funny because last year um uh, when i would go up to count the cows they'd often follow me down the hill. I'd be like the Pied Piper of Hamlin, but yeah. instead of a load of rats, it would be a load of a herd of cows. And one time they started stampeding me and I was thinking, goodness me, that, what the hell do I do here? Because they, they were running towards me. Um, so I turned around and started scarping down the hill um, to try and get to the fence. And of course they weren't chasing me. They were running down to drink the water from the trough. So um, Yeah, actually, as, as, as we... Sounds like we've got one or two farmers listening. Um, it'd be interesting to have somebody sort of write in and say, this is what you do when chased by a herd of cows, because um, I hear sort of conflicting uh, views on that. Um, I've, 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 I've read that, you know, you should sort of stand your ground and um, you know, turn around and, and sort of not run at them, but sort of, you know, wave your arms and, and 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 speak firmly to them. But <laughs> that was one thing. Some somebody else said run away. Um, so it would be good to know. I I was chased by a herd up on Milk Hill actually, and they were um, on on the uh, the nature reserve uh, lands up there. And I mean they, they they were just very inquisitive, but they were young um, young bullocks, I think. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I, they can be quite I'm... intimidating. They they can. I mean, I remember last last summer I got chased by a, a little bullock on uh, Milk Hill, um, and and nothing came of it. I just walked very swiftly up to the top of um, the hill and out of sight. But yeah. um, well, having it was a bit the dis- ground. Yeah, it was a bit disconcerting then because of course the herd was right over the public footpath that takes you off the hill. So yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, it's it's just one of, one of the hazards of walking in the countryside. But yeah, if if we could get some advice from some um, people that know what they're doing around cows, that would be fantastic. Yeah. Terrific. Actually, on the on the parsonage down where we've got English Longhorn, I mean they they are very very placid and you know obviously you have to be careful, but you, yeah. you certainly don't go in between a, a, a mother and its calf. But yeah. um, apart well, from that, that, I mean the, they're they're really cuddly. <laughs> yeah, I know that the the cows they have over on Tan Hill and and they are red rubies i think and they're very docile they're quite can be quite big um yeah. but they're, they're very friendly i walked past them last year and no, no problems at all but we've had um a, a fantastic post that we put on the website from our, our good chum steve dewey who we will get on the show he's not going to get away with it but uh, yeah do you want to you're going to talk yes. about that aren't you? And, and it's actually relevant to to this podcast and the one from before so we're talking about the devils again this week we talked about it last time but of course um, the common thing that runs through that area is the River Wiley, which starts just outside of the villages and flows all the way down to Wilton, in just on the outskirts of Salisbury. But Steve did um, a fantastic 
blog post for the Hidden Wiltshire website. So if you go to the hiddenwiltshire.com, you will see it on the River Wiley. And what he did is he, he travelled along the length of it and stopped at each bridge and took a photograph. And he's really documented the story of the river as you walk or as you go along it all the way from source to, to end, really. It's a fantastic blog post. Yeah. And the most impressive thing was that he used the word bosky which for years and years and years I've been looking for an excuse to use that word and Steve beat me to it. So well done, Steve. Bosky, B-O-S-K-Y, yeah, Bos- look it up. And I, I did because um, <laughs> um, it was one word that I've, I'd never come across in English. So it, I had to get the dictionary out, but I was quite impressed that, um, you know, you managed to weave that into the blog post. Yeah, I, th- I think he speaks a, 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 a strange version of English, some old old English English. Yeah. <laughs> But I did notice, actually, on the Facebook page, you'd also been recently to Eddington Church, the Priory Church. Yeah, yeah. And it's, um, again, enticing people to stick with us to the end. Um, the, the, the thing we're going to talk about right at the end is the reason I was over there. Um, but, yeah, I had to, I went over to Steeple Ashton and um, on the way back, I stopped at Eddington Priory Church um, uh, principally because I drove right past it and I've never actually been in before. And uh, and it was open, which was um, which is good news because so many churches at the moment are not open. Um, bumped into a very interesting guy who I think is one of the team that one of the volunteers that just helps look after it. And um, there were some people in there drawing up sort of a quote to him to for the lighting inside the church, which I really didn't think was necessary because the lighting in there is beautiful. Um, so yeah, he was. We were chatting for a while um, at an appropriate distance, wearing face masks, um, and uh, yeah, he, he told me quite a lot about the church. So there's a bit of a, um, a post about that on the Facebook group. But um, and, and and this is a contrived segue, I guess. But uh, there's a connection between Eddington Priory Church with. Um, uh, Imber, where we've been before, in that in Eddington Priory Church there are two stone effigies of, of, of knights. And I don't know if it's two different knights or the same knight who. Um, and, and the effigies came from the church in Imber. So when Imber was evacuated, various um, sort of possessions were taken away, and the two stone effigies were put in uh, the church at uh, Eddington. Um, and the font. Uh, went to uh, Brixton Devil Church, where we're going to go in a minute. Um, and of course, there is the King Alfred connection between Eddington and Brixton Devil, where we're going to go now. We are this week we're going to this fortnight we're going to return to part two of our um, Devil's Walk. Um, two weeks ago we sort of walked from Kingston Deverell to the south in the hills around um, Summerslate Down, Pertwood and, and that area and we finished off by dropping down into to, to Brixton Deverell um, where the, 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 the walk which uh, I think I wrote a blog on the 25th of May 2020, if I remember rightly, which is on the website. Um, so we're going to do the sort of second part of that walk today, um, but starting in in Brixton Deverell. And when I did the walk, uh, I I must be the only person in Wiltshire or beyond that wasn't aware of this, but there was a fantastic Roman find in in Brixton Deverell. Um, so I went back some time later to sort of photograph the location for this this find and the, the story is that um, there's a guy called uh, Luke Irwin who is a uh, basically deals in, in rugs 
um, sort of a, a London sort of showroom, very successful rug dealer. And he and his family bought a house in Brixton Deverell uh, some years ago, and they were converting some outbuildings and they wanted to put some power into um, to, to one of the outbuildings. So that's some workmen in digging a trench and he um, Luke Irwin has, has made a sort of great little video about it, um, which you Google it and watch it. And apparently there was a sort of cry from one of the workmen and he went in and they he, he was basically looking at this trench and there was this sort of what turned out to be a fantastic mosaic, fantastic preserved mosaic, and a, a Roman mosaic. So this was 2015. So um, they covered it up and Erwin called sort of, um, Wessex, uh, sorry, Wessex, Wiltshire Council, you know, the archaeologists, who came over and looked at it and they were just you know, astonished at the, the find. So they did some excavations in Erwin's back garden, basically dug his garden up. And it turns out that this is the site of a, a vast um, uh, Roman villa. And again, if you Google this, you can see the sort of the, the, the artist's impression of it. I mean, it's two stories, it covers a huge area, very, very impressive um, Roman villa, which was, was built sometime. And, and, and I think as, as there were sort of different owners, it, they started building this villa, are they thinking around 175 um, AD? And various works would continue through to sort of around 220 AD. And the site was was occupied um, later until about the, the, the fifth century AD. So this was a really important site. And for a villa of this size, um, it must have been a very important person that, that, that lived there who first had it it, it built. Um, and I think uh, the, the the archaeologists, the Wiltshire archaeologists, um, again one of them appears on a, a video saying it, it would have been not really out of place. There was there was there was no sensitivity around building in those days. You know, you want a big villa, you just plonk it right here. You know? And this really would have dominated the um, the, the, the landscape. Um, but the, the the area, you know, that immediate area, like the, the rest of the sort of devils, you know, the, 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 that particular site was occupied right back to sort of Neolithic times, which again lends sort of credence to the, you know, the, the, the fact that this 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 whole area was was was, you know, was very significant and valuable to the people that, that lived and and farmed there. Yeah, and we did uh, talking about the Roman stuff a bit more. We did talk last time around about the fact that some people strongly believe that two Roman roads intersected at the Ford in Kingston Deverell. Um, so it was, you know, it, it, it kind of makes sense that you'd have Roman finds in that area, but the size yeah. of that um, villa sounds absolutely incredible. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it, it was, um, it was covered back up again. So after they did the excavations, um, you know, as Luke Irwin says in his little video, he didn't really want, you know, to live in a museum. Uh, yeah. So, which I don't think I would either. So that, that's that's understandable. But one of the incredible things was they had a, um, or they have a sort of stone trough in their their garden, which they were using for for growing flowers. And um, apparently, this, this Wiltshire archaeologist sort of wanders over and says, you know, can t tell me about this. And uh, you know, Luke Owen says, well, you know, we found it in the garden. We've been growing flowers in it. He said, "Well, this is actually um, a, a Roman coffin for for a, a, a child. So he was growing flowers in it. But um, if, if if you go to Brixton Deverell, uh, I mean, there's there's nothing to be seen now. There is a, um, a footpath that goes along the um, the end of the back of the garden, and as you and that's why I went back. I thought, well, I don't remember seeing any sort of sign of this, and there is nothing to be seen. There's some very slight." sort of mounds in, in, in the garden. So, you know, don't, don't, don't go sniffing around Mr. Irwin's garden because he won't thank you for it and there's nothing to be seen anyway. But yeah. uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's an incredible sight, it really is. I mean, you know, what a find. Yeah, and it, it's the other thing I wanted to, to bring up because um, I only picked this up since the last podcast is that um, there's been some interesting archaeology found or carried out in that area and they found some interesting things like the, the Kingston Deverell Hoard which is in Salisbury Museum um, 
I don't know if you want to say a few words about that, Paul. Um, yeah, I, I actually it was something that I meant to mention in the, the, the last podcast where we sort of started this walk from Kingston Deverall. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I did make some notes about it and I, I can't remember exactly where they, they found it. Do you know where they found it? I think it was somewhere somewhere close to the road. Um, I'm not sure of the exact location, but it, mm. it, it seems to be there's a school of thought that says it might have been a traveller along the road that decided to bury his stuff to collect it later. Yeah, well, what I read was actually this this was like almost like a, a typical canteen that uh, a Roman soldier would have carried um, because I think that you know, similar goods have, have been found elsewhere. And so, again, the story about it being buried, but it was actually a Roman soldier that sort of stashed it and, you know, presumably never came, we obviously never came back for it because it's been found, um, you know, in, in the relative, relatively recent past. I think uh, one of the, the items within it had a stamp on that oh, that's allowed right, yeah. them to, to work out where it was from and apparently mm-hmm. it was it was a well-known pot maker from Pompeii yeah so this thing's traveled all the way up from Pompeii to Kingston Deverell it's quite amazing but so, well, I think uh, some of the goods were, were they not um, of a metal were they tin or something yes yeah it's yeah. a five five piece hoard of Roman metalwork effectively yeah. um, you've got strainers that are used to heat and remove the sediment from wine um you've got pots that are used to heat liquids um so it was like a collection of of metal work um so so a bit like you 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 know when you go camping you say your yeah. collection of camping stoves that all slot together it's some, something like that yeah. um but yeah it's it's a fascinating find and um there was there, there is also talk i've read that there is um there are um, there's nothing to see now of course but there are the remains of a roman temple on one of the hills nearby as well so there was yeah. Roman, something very Roman going on in this area. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I think you know we'll we'll, we'll come to that uh, in a bit because um, it sort of if we're following the that that mm. walk, it sort of comes at the almost at the very end. Um, but um, from, from from Brixton Deverell again, it, it, it's worth having a look at the, the church. Now, I, when I went. Um, you know, well, I've been several times now, but um, when I went back to have a look at the location for this, the, the Roman villa, I went to the church and it was, I guess, tail end of last year. And uh, sadly, the, the, the church was shut because I wanted to look at the, the, the font from, from Imber. Um, but it is a it's, it's a beautiful church. It's just a, a stunning setting. Bit, it reminded me a little bit of the, the church at Bratton. It's sort of tapped up tucked away off the road um, not very far off the road but you have to sort of go up a track to get to it there's some, some sort of houses up there leading up to the church and then some, some beautiful views along the the, the Deverell's you know, very very peaceful spot and hopefully if listeners get a chance to go there then you know it'll be open and you can go and visit um, but um, you know it's worth just you know having a look around Brixton Deverell before you leave um, the, uh, the 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 Wiley sort of the River Wiley flows through there, which is you know it, it's little more than a, a large stream at that point, and it goes um, it goes right under the road. So there's a little the road there's a pretty little bridge that goes over it. Um, but f- on, on the walk, I sort of um, from the church, I sort of headed down to the the, the road that runs through Bricks and Deverell and turned east towards Longbridge Devil and I went to the, you, you, you'll, you'll see the route on the on, on the website but um, I then sort of went went down the road for a couple of hundred meters I think and then headed up into the hills again and uh, the day I did the the walk which I recorded for for, for Hind Wiltshire um, it was it must it, I guess it was springtime late spring maybe and I remember walking up um it wasn't quite a hollow way, but it was a, a, a sort of a, a track that had sort of, you know, well worn and sort of sunk in, you know, with hedges, hedgerows either side. And I just just remember the the, the wild flowers there were just stunning, I mean, they were just everywhere. And again, it was a very quiet sort of spring day. I didn't see anybody at all. And basically, the walk takes you up. You're heading sort of ever upwards, um, and eventually you come out onto the the, the, the chalk downland, um, and uh, 
you sort of head up towards uh, a place called Brims Down. And from Brims Down, which is a, it's described on the map as a, a, a fur, fur copse, I think it's, it's termed on, on the OS map. And you, you basically head out towards the, the cops. And I always stop there and, you know, for a coffee because it's just a, you know, the, the views are fabulous. And you're still climbing. You're still going up sort of quite gentle climb. But it's just worth sort of pausing there and, and, and looking back, particularly to the east um, and sort of along the Wiley Valley, really. Um, but from there, you're sort of, again, you're following up a bridleway along the ridge top and just, just, just heading west at that point. Um, and the again, you sort of as you as you climb and as you're just sort of heading along the ridge top, you look away down to the uh, down to your right, which would be what to the north, I think. And you know we have our favourite subject: bottoms. There are bottoms everywhere there. <laughs> These dry valleys, um, and I, I mean I just love that whole area it, it's always really striking and really makes for, for a great photograph with you you know black and white or color yeah it's just the way yeah. the sun picks out the folds in the land yeah and those those dry valleys the bottoms really are a bit of a photographer's dream i mean up there the the, the there's plenty of them um there's loads of interesting shapes in the landscape almost like it's been carved out and the land you know they've been scooped out by a giant or yeah, something that's a great um, description so i mean you've got um from sort of almost due west of brims down you're looking down into uh woodcombe bottom um and then sort of the slopes above it to the north of bidcombe hill um and then as you're heading along the ridge to the sort of by this time you're heading southwest um in front of you you've got bushcombe bottom um and there are various sort of rights of way. I mean, you know, please don't go tramping around. It's not open access, so keep to the rights of way. But, you know, you look at the map and there are, there are, there are lots of opportunities to sort of go and explore along there. Um, but heading along that ridge from Brims Down and you're heading towards Cold Kitchen Hill. That's your next sort of landmark. Um I, I came across, and I know, Glenn, you did this walk as well. Um, you come across that, that building up at the top, which I described it as a as, as a man cave, which is, but it could equally be a woman cave or whatever it is. Uh, but it sits at the top of the hill, and um, I, I, I don't know what it may be. The local ship uses it um, because there's a little kitchen in there, a great big picture window at the back looking across the uh, the, the, the you know the Devils, the Wiley Valley to um, you know Summer Slate Down, and I mean the views up there are, are just absolutely epic. I know it's funny because I, I, this building is quite big. I mean you can yeah, see it, it from, from a long way away. When when I was walking towards it, I thought it must be a big barn or something. Um, but no, it looks like a um, sort of holiday home. It does, yeah. The hill. <laughs> and the views are fantastic from up there. Yeah. Um, of course, it's right next. It's it's very close to. Um, Another feature in the landscape as you walk up Cold Kitchen Hill, which is the Long Barrow. Yeah. Um, and we've talked about Long Barrows at length because actually we're very blessed with having lots of them in Wiltshire. Um, but it's another fine example of a very strategically placed Long Barrow. Because um, yeah. I've, I've seen that, I've spotted that from over in Warminster when I've been walking up Scratchbury. And it must be five miles as the crow flies, but very visible. Yeah, it's. Um, I was looking at dimensions of that. I mean, it's... 70 meters long by 27 meters wide and four meters high so this is a big beast and it it's it's still sort of really well preserved because it's only been partially excavated and i think you know uh, uh, another friend of the podcast sir richard colt hall who died about 200 years ago or whatever but um he uh, I, I think he did some partial excavations up there but it's pretty much intact uh, and of course, you don't really get that much of a sense of it from ground level. I mean, you could, you're right; you can see it from a long way off as you walk, and it's sort of like you know, it's a, it's a landmark as you continue along the walk that uh, you know that we, we we blocked about. Um, but it's only from the air that you really see the scale of this this thing. And um, there's a we've mentioned it before. This guy who does a lot of drone photography. 
Um, it's got an Instagram feed called David Abrams, I think. A B R A M S. Yes. Yeah. And yes. he's photographed it from from the air, and it, it it it's remarkable how sort of perfectly preserved this this barrow is. Yeah, you don't, you don't appreciate it from ground level when you're actually on top of it. It doesn't look too impressive. It, it but but that photograph from above it really stands out and as i say when you look at it from a distance it kind of stands out but yeah um but it's again it's a bit like tin head in it isn't on the the, the crest of the you know, it's not on the top of the hill it's slightly down to one side so you can see it from certain directions but not others you could yeah. go not very far away and not be able to see it at all yeah yeah it, it's fascinating where, where, to think about where how and why they chose these locations um what message they were trying to send to other people who lived in the landscape yeah, um, yeah. but being um you know being a long barrow it, it's you know it's neolithic so you know makes it what i don't know two and a half to three and a half thousand bc yeah so you know this, this is you know from dates from man's sort of earliest occupation or earliest settlement in in, in this area when, when sort of farming began yeah yeah, very, very old um, and really just reinforces what we've said about this area. It's been farmed by humans for thousands of years. Yeah. Um, and, and, and just after the, the Long Barrow and, and, and pretty close by, you see the Trig Point, which is the, the summit of, of Cold Kitchen Hill, which um, uh, it's it's for, for statistics geeks it's it's 257 meters high it's one of the highest points in wiltshire it, it's i don't know something like number five or a bit, a bit lower down in terms of the pecking order of, of, of heights but um, it, it it feels like it should be almost number one because of the the, the views up there um and again i think you and i both taken photographs and posted them on the the website i mean to the west you you, you can look across from the beak from the um uh from the, from the trick point and you can see little knoll and long knoll um over towards stour head you can see alfred's tower um again over by um stour head but way way beyond that and also to the south i mean every direction the views are just stunning they really are um just after cold kitchen hill uh, and again you know it's it's within just a couple of hundred metres, I think, from memory. Um, you've got a Jubilee beacon um, f- built for the... Um, yes, there's a whole load of these across built across the country for the, the Queen's, whichever Jubilee it was. Um, so sort of a big wooden post with a f- sort of fire basket on top. And uh, that actually is something else that really dominates the landscape from a... You know, you can, you can see that from a very, very long way away for, you know, for obvious reasons. But again, sort of continuing to head... Um, you kind of turn you're turning west now having headed sort of southwest to get to cold kitchen hill you're now heading west and you've got the beacon there and um i, I think just uh, basically from from there the walk you know i ended up back down at kingston deverell where i i parked the car but before we sort of descend uh, back down there and I, I just have something to say about rights of way um but be, but before descending it's worthwhile just continuing along the ridge top um so you're you're heading around you're, you're you you sort of turn and then you head sort of northwest um and you're looking down into bushcombe bottom that we talked about earlier and you're heading towards uh white cliff down and, and again you've got woodcombe bottom that we talked about earlier and some some beautiful uh woods there where um, again, the bluebells, we are talking about spring earlier on, the bluebells in those woods are just stunning. Um, and, you, and you're heading to, uh, to towards Brims downhill. Um, but Whitecliffe Down is the site of the temple that you mentioned earlier on. Um, so that's um, a, a, a Romano British uh, temple. And it's it, it, it's quite a size. Um yeah, 50 metres by 50 metres, I, I read somewhere. Um, so it, it was a te- temple, it wasn't a settlement. Um, so, so, you know, obviously a place of, of, of worship. Uh, but the whole way around there, again, you're looking at the, the map, you've got 
you know, earthworks, tumuli, they're, they're, they're marked, they're, they're marked everywhere around there. So again, sort of really historic landscape. Um, but heading, basically, you, you want to get back down to Kingston Deverell and um, somebody contacted me um, and I think he'd read the walk on the uh, the, the face on, on the website that's right and he asked me how I got down from um, around the beacon bush Coon bottom the head of Bishop yep. bush, back down to to Kingston Deverell and it opened up a bit of a debate because when you look at the map the bridal way which we've been following across the, the the ridge there the ridge line from brims down cold kitchen it sort of meets um another bridal way which comes up from kingston deverell but they don't actually certainly looking at the os map they don't actually join so you have to get across from one to the other now when you're up there and you look at the landscape they're actually right next to each other but they're divided by a fence so what I did was to follow the bridal way to, towards um, uh, sort of White Cliff Down and, and, and that direction. And there's, I can only describe it as it, it's a jump uh, which has been built obviously for horses because I've seen people horse riding up there on, on several occasions. And I think it's just a, a, a jump. So what I did was I stepped across that, that jump, which took me from one bridal way onto the other. Yeah, I've you, done that. I've done that before. Yeah, I know exactly what thing. you mean. Yeah. So you, you're almost turning back on yourself and coming the direction you, you've, you've just come, but heading diagonally across the slope back down the hill. And um, that was the only way that I could see to get across from one bridal way to the other. Now, the guy that contacted me, um, he'd been cycling across the top, which is perfectly you know, legitimate. It's a bridal way. You can cycle on it. And he lifted his bike over that that jump, and the, the farmer happened to be up there, and you know basically sort of told him to, he, should, he should stick to the bridle way or stick to the rights of way. So he he strayed off the the rights of way, which you know that that was that was sort of in, intriguing because you've got this sort of two bridle ways running side by side for for some distance, you know sort of heading off to the west, and there seems to be no. I don't recall a gate in the fence getting you from one to the other. I need to go back and check. Um, so certainly if you're on a bike, there doesn't seem to be any legal way of getting from one to the other. Um, yeah. I mean, just looking on the map, you can see the two paths are running parallel Yeah, for yeah. quite some time. It's quite some way. And, the, and you can see there's a fence marked in between them. So, um, yes, that's right. Um, that's a tricky one. Yeah. So, you know, if, if, if you, you know, if you want to be, which we should, we should stick to rights of way. I'm not going to encourage anybody to, to stray off rights of way. There are other ways down from Cold Kitchen Hill um, that will take you back down to Kingston Deverell. Um, you know, it, it, if, if you wanted to go and have a look at the beacon, the Jubilee beacon, you, know, you could walk from Cold Kitchen Hill, go down to the beacon turn around and then head back um but uh you 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 can get on to the mid wilts way which is marked on the map um so that's one way that head, you, you're heading east again uh, towards uh what's called cross dyke which is um uh, cross dyke is a feature in the landscape it's it's a it's earthworks which were built it's thought of built as a sort of land boundaries so you're heading towards that and then you've got a you know you meet up with in fact the mid wilts way then does a, a a sharp right and heads south back directly down to to kingston devil so you know you can get down perfectly legitimately without leaving uh, rights away what you can't do is um it, you can't do it on a on a, on a bike or a or, or a horseback because um, it's not a bridal way it's a mid wilts way is a footpath there um, I think, unless somebody can correct us on that, but that's the way it looks. Um, but um, our, our chum Steve Dewey did post on the, the Facebook group when I mentioned this and the difficulties this this guy had, had um, keeping to 
to right away and he sent me a link to the wiltshire definitive map um, which is which is now online and definitive maps are you know th legally that's that's the go-to point so any disputes about rights of way and stuff you have to go back to the definitive map and um so i looked at that and it's, when you go into the, the, the zoom in on your computer screen to the highest magnification they look to me as though they overlap those two those two bridleways so i don't know does that make it legal to to go from one to the other um i suspect the guy that was on his bike i, I think probably the, the the farmer mate his concern might have been damaged to that that horse jump um you know i i, I remember i sort of just stepping over it you know cause damage in any way and maybe the farmer would be fine with people stepping over it but you know maybe a bike was a, a bridge too far but i think you found out that or maybe some somebody suggested that maybe there's there's been issues of people straying off rights of way up there i think it's been a a contentious issue throughout lockdown not just there but yeah i think the problem is that um with people being restricted about what they can do more people have gone walking in the countryside and aren't as familiar and up to speed with you know the rules around rights of way and um you know and, and not really understanding things like the countryside code yeah. so so it's it has caused issues with some paths and um you know a, a classic is in the winter when paths get muddy people yeah try and avoid the mud and yeah. then you end up straying onto you know farmers fields and things like that and can get yourself into trouble because um obviously farmers are usually quite tolerant of people that are respectful but yeah you know if too many people are straying off the path that's going to cause them an issue. yeah and there is cultivated land up there and there are several notices about you know keeping to the rights of way and, and, and privacy yeah. uh you know not privacy but you know not not damaging crops so you know you absolutely get where farmers are coming from they've got a difficult enough job as it is um without having people sort of damaging crops so um, but i think you know i, I we, we, we 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 can but advise people to keep to public rights away that's the right thing to do oh, absolutely absolutely it's interesting though when you when you were talking about that area at the top because one place I have not gone and explored the other side of the the hill towards Brimsdown Hill and Bidcombe Wood that way. Yeah, and it's just it's just inspired me from talking about this. I'm going to get over there because I want to go in that wood and see the bluebells this year. Um, yeah, I did. Um, I I th I can't remember if I did it as a, a a blog or put some photographs on the um, we, we, going back when I first started sort of writing stuff for for him wheelchair but i did do a walk over that way with my son a few years ago um and we went down through bidcombe wood um and sort of walked along if you look at the map there's a uh i think it's a bridal way which which skirts the edge of edge of bidcombe wood and sort of heads east and we walked all the way along there and that was a, a different walk um and then we sort of eventually came back over um brims down again so we sort of did the walk, but, but heading north instead of south over the, you know, where we were yeah. two weeks ago. So yeah. we, 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 we headed north. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it, it's it, it's quite the landscape's quite different in nature. It's um, you don't get the, the you know, the, the, the coombs and the bottoms that we, we do or to, to the south of Kingston Deverall and, you know, where we've just been talking about. Um, t to the north, the slopes become much more gentle. So you're looking out towards sort of Longleat and, 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 and that way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, well, well worth a, a, a visit there. Um, I did see a walk. Um, I can't remember. Maybe it was the Ordnance Survey website, something like that. But there's there's, there's another um, walk which looks really nice that starts from Longbridge, Deverell. Um, down near the A350 and that takes you sort of up around the area we've just been talking about but also it's, a, it's quite a big circuit that takes you up um, to the to the south of the Wiley as well it's that's about eight or nine miles from from memory and that looks to be like a, a, a nice walk as well yeah there's no shortage of um, walk, circular walk potential looking at this map there's yeah. so many rights of way and um, yeah lots of places to explore and it's well worth it yeah but uh, again sort of going back to 
you know the, the, the history i mean you're looking at all those you know all all around the place up there you know the barrows and the tumuli and uh, i mean this this whole area this 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 neolithic this bronze age this iron age this romano british this medieval um, archaeology everywhere up, up there it's you know it really is a historic landscape okay so i think we can uh, pretty much wrap up this, yeah. this talk now and uh, where do you think we'll go next time then well before we do that shall we talk about a little surprise for for listeners yeah i think you can put everyone out of their, their misery i'm sure yeah, they've all been yeah. waiting with bated breath to the end of this just to hear this yeah point. they will so come on we want to hear the offer um so uh, with all the walking i do I, I do get through walking boots at a rate of knots and uh, so i was looking for some boots recently and um i i, I actually posted a question on uh uh, another facebook group for um a photography facebook group which i've been listening to for, oh sorry been reading for years and they also a couple of photographers have a, a a podcast which is fantastic um and for the photographers amongst you it's called the fuji cast and um one of the guys who who presents this is a guy called kevin mullins who's a terrific principally a, a well, he called himself a wedding photographer, but a documentary photographer who lives in Malmesbury, Wiltshire. So he's, he's a, a local lad. So I put a post on the Fujicast uh, Facebook group saying, uh, anybody got any recommendations for walking boots? Because um, the, the other the, the other presenter is a guy called Neil James, who lives up near um, Newbury and does um, a lot of walking, I know. And he actually does a, a, another podcast called The Photography Daily such um podcast so he does a lot of walking in the sort of the new beer and he's he was raving about these boots that he bought called um lover um, i think is how you pronounce it it's l-o-w-a um so i put a podcast uh, sorry i put a post on the facebook group saying you know do you still like your boots and you know what do people think of lover and people piled in and say they're fantastic boots and there's some other re- great recommendations as well so i started looking at lover and i thought well yeah maybe maybe this one this particular boot and then this guy pops up and said um i normally keep fairly quiet on social media he said but you know i i i think he's something like marketing director for lover you uh, lover uk but he, he actually, he, I think he's one of the guys who runs the UK distributor um, uh, for, 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 for Lova Boots. And I thought, oh, I should have written down the name. I think they're called TKC. And um, guess what? They're in Steeple Ashton. So they're in Wiltshire. So they're locals. Um, they're locals. And yeah. um, Tim Kington, who I've been talking to there, uh, actually had listened to the Bratton Eddington podcast and he, he said, I would listen to it. And he said, I can see Bratton from my office window. So, <laughs> um, so there's a sort of local connection there. And um, anyway, I, I, I did end up buying a, a, a pair of their boots. And I've got to say, the service was just outstanding for them. And so in lockdown, you can't go and try boots on or anything. So, you know, he, he kept sending me pairs of boots to sort of try on at home to get the right size and make sure I was happy with them. And I ended up, you know, buying this, this a, a, a pair of their boots, um, but he was he was very keen to support us. So he said, "Look, he said, you know, how about offering a, a, a discount to your, your your podcast listeners?" So I thought, oh, you know, that'd be great. You know, sort of five or ten percent discount, and, he, and he's he's given us a twenty percent discount of of, of Lover boots. Wow! Um, so if you go to Lover l-o-w-a dot co dot uk and you want to buy buy a pair of their boots when you sort of do your checkout you put in a discount code which is hw hidden wheelchair hw20 and it will not 20 percent off the price so don't say we never do anything for you well that's good actually yes that's, it's good as well because there's a local link there and we're supporting a local business yeah absolutely um, and the listeners, the gentleman you spoke to is a listener of our podcast. He so, is. Um, that's fantastic. So if you listen to this, Tim, thank you very much. Much appreciated. I certainly appreciate it. And we, we bought a pair of boots for my wife now as well. So. Oh, there you go. So where are we going next time? 
where are we going next time? Um, I think we're going to go to sort of Castle Coombe direction, aren't we? Um, we are, we are. And actually, we, let, let's just qualify that because um, this podcast is called Hidden Wiltshire and Castle Coombe isn't very hidden. However, um, most people just go to the village. And this podcast, we're not going to do that. <laughs> no. We're going to go to, We're going to park there and then not go there. Yeah, a park just outside. So again, it's it's a, a, a walk that I did last year um, and wrote a blog about it. And I, yes, we'll tell you more for the next podcast, but I ended up going all over the place and ended up walking about 15 miles. But uh, it doesn't need to be that long. But I was just huge surprise in terms of the countryside around there, which I've never really, I certainly haven't explored for about 30 years. And, uh, you know, varied. Um, and I, you know, Castle Coombe has been done to death, so I didn't even go into the village. I kept kept out of it. Uh, but there's way more to see down there than, than, than just Castle Coombe. Absolutely, and that's what this is all about. So we'll be back in two weeks with yeah. Castle Coombe. And we've got some we've got some different music to play you out with today, haven't we? Um, Steve Dixon's been composing again and recording. Um, so the piece we're going to sort of play out with um, is called Downlands. Um, and uh, so this will be the, 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 the second or the second uh, snippet from from downlands um and see if you can identify the bird song or the bird call um in the first bit there was there was one bird and now it's a different bird in the outro so let us know what you think it is <laughs>